I've become quite wary of poorly done neuroscience. But I should say from the outset that I remain optimistic, even highly optimistic, about the promise of cognitive neuroscience to meaningfully inform a broad range of disciplines, including management. Actually, I should say, it's not really that I feel optimism. What I feel is a mixture of confidence and concern. I feel that I know neuroscience is going to transform not only applied fields like management, but also areas as apparently far afield and theoretically aloof as philosophy. I don't even think we'll need to develop any new methods for this to occur. Although clearly some new methods have great promise. I know this because I see it in my own work. I see how much information we have already acquired, far more data than we have put to good, clear-headed scientific use. Hence my narrative, unlike the narrative of Weights and Mason, or the narrative that Barack Obama's team of advisors are coming up with in Washington at the moment, is not a narrative about the great promise of revolutionary new approaches. Rather, it's a narrative about consolidating and making good sense of what we've already got, about encouraging our current science to settle down and mature. I don't have any doubt that neuroscience will eventually transform understanding in every discipline that concerns itself with the human mind. What I am concerned about is how efficient our progress towards that goal is going to be. And there are obviously going to be teething pains along the way. Okay, so now let me turn to a critical review of this article, Your Brain at Work. What a new approach to neuroscience can teach us about management. By Adam Waits and Molly Mace. Okay, so this is how they, they set up their article. They say, we're gonna, stuff before has been phrenology, we're gonna give you a different view. This is the new approach, the network view. So they point out that there are reverse inference um, errors for individual regions, and that this has um, plagued some research. They're gonna switch to a network view, and they're gonna tell us a story about each network. And the stories they're gonna tell us are pretty plausible, right? And they're richly informed by research in neuroscience, psychology, and behavioral economics. This is intelligent stuff, right? But there are some initial problems. One is that the brain areas are not defined. In fact, this nice uh, picture, which is jolly pretty, is about as good as we get to define the brain areas. It doesn't correspond to any known networks that I can imagine. This wouldn't necessarily be problematic if we could just trust them, right? But it turns out, in particular, that there's a real problem with the description of the networks, because networks are defined by different criteria. And um, so, say, the reward and affect um, networks are defined by the criteria of um, sort of meta-analysis studies that I was just showing you, like what tasks activate these different areas. The default network is actually defined on a different basis by actually what um, areas get deactivated by certain sorts of tasks. In fact, the default network uh, on any sort of normal definition in the literature includes both the reward and the affect networks, but they're gonna split them up into separate networks. So we were already hitting something which is, I, I mean, I just feel bewildered um, as to what their, their way of separating out the networks is. But they define four networks, and now we'll just quickly go through them one by one and highlight some positives and negatives about each one. Right, so they start with the default network, which is a jolly interesting um, network because of its property of being deactivated. And they point out that when people are awake but not focused on external stimuli, that it activates during this condition. Well, that is indeed consistent with a, with a high-profile publication that Marlia Mason published in 2007. But many people at the time noted that the psychological theory motivating the interpretation in that paper was really rather weak. I mean, the suggestion that there, in that paper, her suggestion was that there is a brain network for spontaneous cognition, and at the very end of the paper, they says, say, suggest maybe this network has no real function. So it's not really um, the most compelling psychological theory that motivated that interpretation, but perhaps um, more tellingly, the consensus has just completely changed since then, right? So actually, the, most people regard rest as, or the, the state when you're not focused on external stimuli or any specific goal, as a restless mix of activity, and you can see different networks come up and down. There's no one particular network that is associated with rest. And in fact, the, de the default mode network activates more during certain specific externally focused goal-directed tasks than it does during rest. So this description is 
uh, maybe a half truth at very best. I mean, it's a very odd way to describe the function of a, of a network that we now know an awful lot more about. Um, so I would point out there have been a number of studies that would suggest Miley Mason's um, uh, interpretation is not very good, um, but one of them comes from my laboratory. Uh, it was published last year in NeuroImage, and you can, so what you can see here in this red regions, uh, which correspond to the default network here, here, um, is that um, this baseline is rest, by the way, the zero point here, and what you can see is that there is very clear and very robust activation of these regions when people are engaged in an empathetic social task. And this isn't the only study to show activation of the default mode network during a, uh, a, an external task as being above rest. Um, there's also meta-analysis, which strongly suggests that this interpretation is wrong. So here's a group in Oxford, uh, Mars et al., who show that there is, uh, using meta-analysis, a strong overlap between the default mode network and areas that are activated by social cognition paradigms. Okay, well, what story do they want to tell us about the default mode network? They have a number of aspects to this story. I'll just highlight some things. They talk about spiritual it being related to spirituality. Yes, there is good evidence for that. They talk about it being related to creativity. And yes, there is a number of um, points of convergence with that, a number of studies which show um, the default mode network, so it appears to be important in creative thinking. But the idea that we necessarily want to activate the default mo mode network while we are, are engaged in a non-social task is not so clear. Because in fact, the same sorts of patterns that are associated with creativity are also markers of mental disorders and low IQ. So um, their advice, which is geared towards encouraging you towards more of this pattern, might be something that you want to just hesitate a little bit about. Their advice in general is sensible, but it certainly can't be safely inferred from the brain science at this point. Okay, let's go on to reward. In the reward network, they emphasize that it responds to a range of stimuli um, that produce enjoyment such as food and water, money and praise. Uh, they say it is involved in perceptions of pleasure and displeasure. Yes, there is very good evidence that reward regions, um, there are different reward regions, they don't name the region, so it's a little bit hard to fully assess this, but um, there is in general good evidence that regions associated with reward for material gains are also so, or activate to non-material gains. In particular, there's very good evidence that these, many of these regions in the ventral striatum, for instance, have um, a strong association with social cognition, so which is a point they emphasize about social rewards being motivated. Um, so that's perfectly reasonable. There are some problems with their description. They say that this is to do with perceptions of pleasure and pain. In fact, motivation and um, pleasure derived from, um, from, from stimuli can be dissociated, and that's very important work in terms of understanding what actually motivates us. Um, they make no mention of that, but that is very important and influential work which has appeared in top journals. They offer psychological advice. It's always very hard to say, well, I mean, it's reasonable enough advice. And actually, in this case, I thought, I thought it fit rather well with the behavioral research that was out there. But it cannot be safely inferred from the brain science, which is the point of their article is to claim, of course, to claim that this is being inferred from the brain science. Okay, now we can move on to affect. How to use gut instinct is their, uh, is their title for the, the, the story that emerges. Well, look, there's a real problem with this network because it's just not even clear what areas they're talking about, right? Because they talk about these, uh, the affect network as being the areas that are involved in experiencing or being in emotional states, um, and yet in all the rest of what they're talking about, they're implying that it's a completely different network. So as I showed you already, there's this dissociation where we have limbic structures that are more associated with being in an emotional state, and then we have default mode network areas which are more involved in representing um, uh, being in an emotional state. It looks like they're talking about overall the default mode network. Um, and, um, but then I think that they need to be more careful how they define it. Actually, their discussion is almost entirely based on old neuropsychological work from the Damasio group, where they look at patients with what's called, often called acquired sociopathy, which is ventral medial prefrontal damage, damage to this whole area. Um, and um, it's an interesting uh, uh, discussion, and um, you know, there has been some problems replicating some of the work from that group, but in general, I think the story holds up well, and it's very interesting. Um, it isn't recent neuroscience. It doesn't depend on taking a network view, um, but uh, it's certainly interesting research. 
Um, I think their psychological advice again seems to fit, seems to me to fit perfectly well with the behavioral research, um, with behavioral research. But again, it cannot be safely inferred from brain science, um, with, with the exception of some insights they take from this interesting neuropsychological work. Okay, finally, they talk about the control network, how to create achievable goals. Um, they say when people, this network is, activates when people weigh long-term consequences um, and uh, check their impulses. So, um, you know, I, I thought, gosh, is that, I mean, I didn't, I know where the control network is, and I thought, I'm not sure that that's true. So I went looking for some evidence. Now, in a part of their discussion, they're quite specific about what they must be talking about. By restraining the reward network, it helps us to resist the lure of costly indulgences and check the impulse to act on immediate needs, $5 today, at the expense of more important long-term objectives, $10 a week from now. Now, this is clearly delay discounting. They couldn't possibly be talking about anything else, right? Um, so I went to look. Well, what, what does um, delays discounting um, identify as a brain region um, that's important? Well, it identifies uh, a very anterior brain region, which is associated with individual differences. Um, this is not in the control network by anyone's definition of the control. Oh, by the way, their claim that, um, that a delay discounting involves reduced reward network activity does seem to be held up. Um, but the other side that the control network is what's doing it, there, there's no clear evidence. Okay, their general story about the control network, it aligns our brain activity and our behavior with our goals. Um, well, yes, I mean, the control network is commonly identified as the executive network, and that's clearly very important for immediate online control and, and, and impulse in, inhibition. But this seems like a much more general statement to me, seems much more like some of the things we're interested in um, in the Department of Organizational Behavior here, where we're talking also about integrating a sort of motivated and meaningful um, aspirational state um, that could continue to motivate someone. That does not look like it's the control network. Um, and indeed, um, there's a papers by very good groups recently that suggest what I think is a reasonable interpretation of a ventral part, ventral medial prefrontal part of the default network as being involved in effective meaning. So this, I think, clearly involves both these components. Um, and uh, I, I can't. Uh, I can't see how one would just want to associate it with one network. Okay, look, the overall narrative here is that they are suggesting there's a problem with reverse inference. They use some nice examples at the start of their thing about some sort of crazy experiments trying to figure out who would be president and uh, things like this. And they note that these people are making the errors of reverse inference. And they start out their article with the claim that prior research or some prior research essentially suffers from the problem of being brain porn and that we are better than brain porn. So they tell us, we feel confident about giving an interim report on the neuroscientific findings of the past 15 years that now have considerable empirical support. Neuroscience, they do inject a note of caution. Neuroscience has taught us surprisingly little about them, how the mind works, but it's taught us a few things extremely well. Those few things are what this article is about. I don't think so. Um, look, this whole narrative is just completely problematic. The problem of reverse inference applies to networks just as much as it does to regions. The problem of forward inference applies to networks just as much as it does to inference. Indeed, we see that they're making that error about the default mode network. They're, in general, not at all precise and they're making these inferential errors. Yes, I think the new network approach adds more. Many people do in cognitive neuroscience, and um, we make reference to how brain areas interact and consider not just a brain area in isolation. It certainly adds more to the story, but it does not melt the basic problems away, which is what this narrative is suggesting. What melts these problems away is careful, precise, hypothesized testing approach. So I also just want to suggest that in some ways in this article, they are finding the wrong error in neuroscience. So early on in the article, they say, you can't scan someone's brain while he watches commercial and tell, tells if he prefers Coke or Pepsi. Well, that may currently be true. I see absolutely no reason whatsoever to suppose that couldn't be true with a little bit more research. You can't scan two CEOs' brains and tell them which person is the better leader. Why not? I really don't know why they think that would be so difficult to do. 
I mean, obviously, you're going to have to do a bunch of research, and you're going to have to hypothesize, hypothesis test it, and you're going to have to be rather more careful than they are in this article. But there's no, absolutely no in principle reason to suppose that we can't do this. And indeed, right now in the press is a very interesting finding, very serious work by a very good researcher showing that activity in the right insula can predict whether you're going to respond better to cognitive behavioral therapy or to a drug when you've got um, severe depression. This is a very important finding. And, you know, I think that there will be further wrinkles that will come out of this story. I'm sure we can get a better predictor if we use more than one brain area. But this paper is pretty striking. You see the differentiation between the people, and you see that there's clearly different outcomes depending on activity in the right amygdala. Here's a perfect example. You get one brain area, and you can do an awful lot with it. And this is not trivial, because depression is a very expensive, I mean, the loss of work due to depression, so actually being able to treat it quickly and effectively um, is very significant. So I, I just can't, I can't see their picture of what's wrong um, with a certain kind of neuroscience as panning out. What I think generates neurononsense is quite different from what they seem to suggest generates neurononsense. I think the problem that generates neurononsense is there's a rush to certainty and a failure to consider and test assumptions, and I think that occurs because, for a number of reasons, but partly because it seems so immediate, it seems so plausible, but also because people are so terribly worried to justify the expense of it, um, and they want to make big claims. There's a lack of emphasis in the field on theory and on decisive tests, and I think this failure of integration, for instance, of one of the most famous psychological theories with evidence from brain imaging, is just, this is, this is, the field's got to move on from this. We need to be more serious about how we're doing this, and we need to, know that there's a methodology paper published in 2006 when we're writing a paper in 2013 and just repeating the error. And what I really take away from looking at all this is that expertise is really more of a barrier than the cost of scanning. People think of the cost of neuroimaging, maybe $500 an hour, um, to do the neuroimaging to collect the data. Um, you, they think of that as a big barrier. I don't see that as the big barrier. I see the big barrier to doing good science, good neuroimaging science, is the expertise of the individuals involved and their willingness to do it carefully and properly. So I want to conclude by suggesting phrenology is not the problem. Now, the phrenologists, of course, really did have a problem because the bumps in your head don't happen to have any relationship to uh, what your individual, the amount of gray matter you've got in individual areas. We do not have that problem. We do get a very reliable signal from brain imaging. Um, but the fact, but we still take a phrenological approach, if you like, and that's just fine. There is no problem with that. The problem, we don't have a problem with our tools, but also the solution is not in our tools. The solution is just about how we use them. And so, if I was sitting on Barack Obama's panel of advisors, I would stop emphasizing, oh, we've got to invest in a new technology which is going to get us yet more detailed information and massive amounts of information. They want to map out every single neuron's activity and how it's talking to every other neuron. You know, we don't even know how to use what we've got right now, and we're not in practice using it sensibly. If you want a, if you want a quick return, which I think will very rapidly come to influence education, management, lots of applied fields, um, and certainly um, like the depression study, um, clinical treatment, then we just need to use what we've got better. We just need to use the tools better.